Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining me for today's Instagram Live uh, interview. Uh, when I'm speaking with a remarkable gentleman, the name of Alan C. Alan is one of the one of the founders of uh, leading men's uh, clothier, outfitter, haberdasher, um, the Armory, um, which has uh, yeah, one, certainly uh, one of the most uh, beautiful uh, menswear stores here in Southeast Asia. And uh, yeah, also in, uh, in New York and perhaps, uh, perhaps the world. Uh, Alan will be joining us uh, shortly and we're gonna be talking about uh, all manner of matters related to uh, uh, sartorialism, menswear, and of course, you know, everything at the moment is kind of viewed through the, uh, through the, uh, the lens of uh, the coronavirus. So uh, yeah, that will doubtless come into, uh, into the conversation as well. Alan, if you can just hit the, uh, the tab that should have come up there saying request to join the conversation, then we'll uh, patch you on in. I do see Alan there. I believe we're getting him for one of his his first Instagram live conversations. So uh, very exciting there, Alan. I promise that. Uh, why is that? Okay, Alan saying requested. Okay. Here we have him, Mr. C, how are you? Hey there, Christian, how are you doing? Good to see you, good to see you, and, and looking uh, very dapper and dashing and, and smashing. Oh, as, thank you uh, to dress up for this occasion, of course, right? Of course, of course. Um, no, the, um, you know, you're, you're, you're someone who's, who's renowned for always, I don't think I've ever seen you without a tie. Is it something that is, is just kind of uh, default mode for you to, to throw a tie on? Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, especially okay. during this whole time where, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have been working from home and you know, yeah. spending sort of less time in the shop as well. So we've definitely a lot of outfits that basically have no ties, a lot of casual outfits. I mean, lots of jeans. Of um, course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Maybe, no maybe it's just the iconic images that exist of you out there are, uh, uh, sporting a tie um but look look speaking of you know what have you been up to um i know you know um probably not everyone watching around the world knows this but but hong kong has kind of emerged from the the covid 19 uh, crisis a lot earlier than uh, than most countries and, and things are pretty pretty normal over there now i believe but um but you know during the period that you were sort of um more kind of stuck at home. Um, how, how did that affect the way that you guys have, have done business or the way that you uh, lived your life in general? Oh, uh, well, I mean, it has been tough, definitely. Um, I think Hong Kong is definitely one of the places that were more prepared in terms of mm. COVID and sort of, uh, you know, to handle a virus of this type of, of magnitude and also, I guess, severity. Um, yeah, yeah. They did go through SARS in the past, and I guess you know over time we've sort of learned to be, or learned that paranoia in, in, in essence, and sort of um, you know as part of our lives almost. And I guess this is this was the new norm for Hong Kong to a certain extent. You know, in terms of yeah. you know proper examples would be in terms of uh, disinfecting lift buttons, for example, and. You know, okay. having all these disinfectant liquids in every building, that was mm. already in place in SARS time. So I guess okay. when COVID came around, it was just really refilling and sort of, um, you know, making that, I guess, more accessible to even more people. And in terms of um, the whole mask thing, uh, we were very quick to, I guess, adopt that in terms of, you know, making a standard for everybody. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah. in terms of, us in terms of getting into that mentality of of getting prepped and being safe that was that was part of us already so it's it, yeah it's been ongoing for quite some time um yeah I would, I would, yeah i wouldn't say that the traffic in terms of you know coming you know coming out of covid is back to normal you definitely do see a lot of people back out in the streets and in terms of 
that um, safety or fear for one's own health, uh, that's definitely calmed down quite a bit. So you do mm. see people out on the streets again, um, you know, taxi queues are back to its uh, almost normal sort of pace and uh, even the beaches, restaurants, I think, I think, you know, it's still hard to get bookings in certain restaurants. So it gives you an idea of how yep. it is. Um, but shopping wise, you know, our shop, it's still, it's still, we do see more traffic, but I think people are still in, you know, sort of the look and see mode almost. So it, it's, it's, back a bit in terms of traffic, which is very reassuring, but in terms of uh, people's spending habits, that's still yet to catch up. Yeah, because the, um, you know, the figure that's, that's really stuck with me is, is that I read um, that in the United States between February and March, um, purchases of, of clothing and, and, you know, obviously not, not just um, at, the, at the upper end, but clothing in general went down by 50.5% which is a you know a dramatic drop from uh, from one month to the next and that all predictions were I haven't seen any any subsequent figures but um, you know all predictions were that that trend would continue as people were um, you know stuck in their homes and and you know perhaps think prioritizing other things rather than uh, than a new outfit particularly considering oh, the fact that you won't be won't be going out on the streets and won't be seen yeah, absolutely. Um, especially from, uh, you know, our shop as well. So where we sell a lot of suiting and jacketing and things like that. We are right in the center of um, basically the finance district, correct? Yeah. So obviously a lot of our customers are the people who work there in office, office workers who are getting their workhorse sort of gray and navy suits. And obviously with everything that's happening now, then you see that drop or just fall off completely of people needing to replace their work suits because they're not using it, you know? Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you think that, that this situation, um, you know, yes, it, it's interesting. And, and this, is, this is kind of coloring a lot of these conversations that I'm having. Um, you know, and yesterday I was speaking with uh, a friend of mine, J.L. Lang, who, who is the founder of a co-working company called The Great Room, who, who do have a, a space in Hong Kong and um, yeah. se several here in Singapore. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I think the discussion that we had was that, you know, potentially um, this could change the whole way that the businesses think about having office space um, and, you know, and having to have all of your employees concentrated in one office space in the downtown financial area or whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. And that that, you know, may really evolve. Do you think that similar things are going to happen to, or, you know, there'll be a sing similar evolution in the work, um, in the work uniform, I suppose. Um, you know, what, what are your, what, what are your predictions for the future? Sartorially? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, during these times, obviously, you have a lot of people working from home. Um, and I guess everyone is getting into that swing as well and sort of recognizing that, you know, uh, a lot of people are able to work from home. There is no sort of absolute need to, to show up at, at the office, I think, for, for those finance guys and all those guys, obviously. Mm. Um, but you do see, obviously, all with all the, the, the abundance of Zoom calls and video conferences and all that, you know, where is that balance of dressing up in a professional manner and still you know, um, having having a more comfort sort of work from home sort of practical outfit. Yeah. Um, but you know, I do I do think you do need to dress up uh, a lot of the time in order just to get that work mode on, right? I, yeah. I've seen so many people and talked to so many people, sort of getting into this um, very sluggish mode. Essentially, you know, they've been working from home, and you know, their hours are topsy and turvy, and mm. and they've sort of found themselves almost in a rut, in a sluggish mode where they feel they're not productive. And uh, you know, just getting dressed in the beginning of the day and sort of is 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 part of it. You know, yeah, it's um, huge psychologically. It just it it flips a a switch in your mind and and gets you into a um, a profession a, a different mode than sure. you know schlebbing around the house, schlubbing around the house all day in, in a pair yeah. of fleecy line tracksuit pants and a, a dirty old t-shirt. Um, 
yeah, yeah. You're, you're not going to be really on point while you're doing that, are you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, there there's still the need to do that. And given that you're still seeing clients in a certain way, whether it be, you know, in person or over Zoom or mm. video or whatever, you know, you still have to have and maintain that sort of professional ism in that sense, especially dress wise. Yeah. Have you been doing a lot of um, a lot of communication over Zoom? You know, you, you're, you're running an international uh, business that crosses all all time zones. Um, has has uh, maintaining that kind of uh, involved you doing a lot of conversations uh, in this fashion? Uh, with our industry, I think there's less so in terms of the Zoom calls. Uh, we have we have been having regular conversations with our suppliers, definitely. Uh, right. It is a tough time for you know a lot of our tailors and suppliers in Italy where they've been in lockdown for a long time. So you know, that, that bit of extra human contact, whether it be through you know phone call or actually seeing seeing their face on on the phone and and Skype or whatever, it, it's it's quite valuable. So yeah, we we do try to Zoom and video call. Well, just basically FaceTime a lot of our suppliers. The nice yep. thing is that you know a lot of our suppliers are smaller artisans, tailors, and shoemakers, and all that. So, um, in that sense, it's it's quite intimate, and we do okay. appreciate a sort of you know very quick FaceTime call and uh, maintain that to maintain that connection. And I, and I guess if if as you say, you're running very much a small atelier or or you know a, a literally a cottage um, cottage business. That's kind of less affected by uh, by everything that's got you know you're not shutting down a a big factory you can probably still maintain that that supply chain or uh, that production process a little bit better than than perhaps someone who is running a, a larger workshop or factory would that be correct well i wouldn't say they're less affected i mean they're i think they're equally affected in terms of especially with the tailors who mm. you know a lot of our tailors are traveling tailors and naturally they have yeah. to come to Hong Kong. They have to go to Japan. And a lot of their business has evolved and sort of transferred out of the country for them over the years. And their inability to go and see the customer has a huge impact on their business. So, you know, the, I guess in a way we're trying to also come up with a lot of different ideas to um, still keep them working and active in terms of the business and, and keep that cash flow going for them. But it's still really tough. Uh, and plus, you know, especially with the smaller tailors, they might also not have that sort of sizable cushion in terms of, yeah. you know, you know, bank bank balance um, as the bigger guys do. So yeah, it's equally as tough for them, I would say. Okay, okay. Now get, going back to we started this conversation um, talking about the about the tie uh, for whatever for whatever reason I uh, I brought that up, but um, you know, there's there's been talk about the you know the the, the the looming demise of the Thai for for many years now and and you know um, it is true that overall sales of of ties if you if you look at the the figures have sort of plummeted from from where they were certainly in the you know 1960s but then 70s 80s um, and and from the 90s onwards it's really been quite a um, um, quite a huge um, huge downturn do you think that uh, that you know, this situation and a further swing towards working from home um, could, you know, really um, bring about that, uh, that, that final um, kind of death knell for this, this beautiful piece of, of cloth that we love to hang around our neck. And, and, and you know, you and I spoke about this uh, the last time we had a conversation a little bit. Um, what's, what's your opinion on, on where that, that world is going? I think so. I mean, uh... Equally, as much as COVID has affected our sort of migration to technology and shopping online, I think equally, then you'll see a lot of the people sort of, if they really don't want to wear a tie, then, you know, there's no need to buy one anymore mm -hmm. in that sense. But at the same time, I don't know, um, I feel that a lot of that drop off in terms of tie purchasing has already happened. And the guys, at least in our case, for example, um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the people who buy ties or at least at that quantity are the people who appreciate them. Yeah. The people who appreciate them are here to stay. Um, 
whether it be working from home or the office, uh, because they're not not only wearing it at the office, but also wearing it on the weekends or or the weekdays or whenever they want to, basically. Yeah. Okay. So the the devoted will remain devoted, and the um, yeah the the naysayers will uh, possibly grow in in number. Um, a question I wanted to ask you, you know, and, it, and it's still kind of on the same topic, is I generally uh, see you with a, with a four in hand, which is, which is certainly my, my favorite uh, tie knot. Um, are you, like me, a believer that the four in hand is really the only tie knot that is, uh, that is necessary? Or are there certain occasions when you go to hell with it, I'm going to do a Windsor knot or a half Windsor or, uh, or something? I, I pretty much, you know... I, I'm I'm a I'm a never Windsor kind of guy. Um, what's your what's your stats? Oh, same here. I mean, yeah, always in a four in hand. That's pretty yeah. much. It. Yeah. Uh, if you want something a bit more symmetrical, we can tweak it here and there. But you know, I think that's this is this is where the beauty lies. Okay. Okay. Um, what? As I mentioned, you know, I, I want to speak about some of the big menswear mistakes that, that guys make. And, you know, I, I think with the Armoury, one, one of the things that, um, that people really love about what you guys do is that, uh, you know, all of your staff, um, whether, it's, whether it's you guys at the top, the founders, right down to, you know, everyone on the shop floor has, um, you know, a really uh, huge breadth and, and depth of, uh, of knowledge about menswear and so that you know when a customer comes to you uh, they can come to you as a complete you know novice and uh, and eventually emerge with with certain expertise so you know I, I guess what, what, what are the what are the major mistakes that that you see guys making and when they come to you you know that those are the things that you really um, at counsel and, and advise them against what are the most common mistakes that you see men making um, that you that you try to guide them away from? Oof. There are so many of them, uh, but I guess the <laughs> most common one nowadays would be basically getting just suits that are too tight for them, right? Okay. Um, with, a, with a misconception that that's shapely, right? it gives you more shape or makes you look slimmer or anything. Um, mm. But there's a lot of people who wear the uh, snug or tight suits into the store. And if anything, it just exacerbates that sort of extra meat around their their waist or wherever there yeah. is. You know? um, but yeah, um, you know, get something that's properly fitted. I think that's one thing that we do in the store quite well is um, we try to suggest or tell them what a proper suit should fit like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, obviously everyone has their own preference and we try to accommodate everyone, but, you know, there's so many, there's so many, so much noise out there. Um, yeah, we just, we just show them, we just show them basically. Okay. Um, I, I, I think one of the, you know, it always frustrates me that, that one of the easiest things to fix or to alter, which is, which is the, the length of, uh, length of the cuff and well, the length of the trouser as well. That so many guys just you know buy an off the rack suit and and don't bother to have that done and it's it's so simple and makes such a such a massive massive difference yeah absolutely um yeah especially i mean it, it's especially tough in hong kong or tough to see in hong kong because we have so mm. so much access to cheap and good tailors here uh, and not only just the tailors who make full suits, but also alterations tailors. And you can get it done for literally less than a hundred bucks for a lot of yeah. the jobs. And we're talking um, Hong Kong dollars there, which is uh, you know, tw dollars, 20, US 20 US dollars. US dollars. Yeah. Uh, which you would never be able to get in, in the US, right? For example, where the costs are so much higher. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, in terms of altering and sort of doing these small tweaks, um, it does so much to the suit and makes it look so much better in terms of proportion. Um, but yeah, that, that, that is also something that we try to explain in, uh, in terms of length of trousers. You know, even in the store, there's a lot of argument of where the trousers should sit or where the, 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 shoot, the, the suit sleeve should sit as well. Um, it, it, it strikes tough. me that it, it's tough. 
yeah, it's tough because every customer, especially the new customers who haven't gotten used to our aesthetic, um, you know, we always have to have a back and forth before we finalize on, uh, you know, an, uh, uh, an in-between or an agreement. But eventually we get there, you know? Yeah. Is, is there still a great um, prejudice against pleated trousers? You know, it, 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 it amused me the other night. I was watching... Stephen Colbert, um, you know, the late show with Stephen Colbert. And, and he, he made a joke where he used pleated pants, I quote, as, as sort of a byword for, for you know, uncool, um, uncool garments, uncool dressing. And yet, you know, I know you guys have been, you know, big uh, proponents of the, of the pleated, uh, pleated trouser. Do you still find a lot of guys coming in and going like, hell no, I'm, I'm you know, I'm never moving away from flat fronts uh yeah definitely um i think there are a lot of terribly done pleated trousers out there so i mean there's sure. some truth to that just from looking at all the pleated trousers you see right um and yeah there are a lot of uncool pleated trousers out there but um at the end of the day in the army our pleated trousers are amazing so you know <laughs> yeah. Uh, thankfully, in Hong Kong, with the tailoring scene being there, um, a lot of pleated trousers can be done right. So, if anything, they should be more slimming, uh, more slimming, yeah. you know, more comfortable, uh, you know, more shaped. You know, what, what else do you want? What else? Exactly, do you want? exactly. Yeah. As as my friend Antonio has just pointed out in the comments, um, and he's correct. It was Colbert said that pleated pants coming back was a sign of the apocalypse, one of the many signs of the uh, coming end of days, which we seem to be, uh, seem to be living through. But, you know, and you, mentioned, you mentioned comfort, um, which I think a lot of the tailoring that's, uh, that, that the Armoury um, specializes in or pushes, um, you know, stuff, particularly things like ring jacket, um, you know, incredibly comfortable. Is that, you know, a great sort of gateway for younger guys, I guess, who have who've sort of grown up wearing um, much more athletic clothing, uh, you know, very sort of uh, comfortable sportswear and, and casual wear, who have that idea in their mind that the tailoring is going to be stiff and uncomfortable, um, you know, does it prove a, a revelation for them when they, um, when they try on uh, some of the stuff that you guys have got? Uh, I don't know whether comfort is one of the big ones. Definitely for shoes, you know, leather shoes, okay. that's a huge thing in terms of comfort. But in terms of suiting itself, I think they're always in the mind, not from a comfort perspective, more, but more of a stuffy perspective. You know, it's like suiting, jacking, I'm going to look like an old man. Okay. Essentially. And I think that's one thing that I guess the army was, was and what we've been doing is sort of, um, making young men a bit more relevant in suiting and, you know, or wearing old sort of, you know, checks like this and gun club and, you know, everything that you associate it with, uh, with uh, your old, you know, professor at school, you know, we're trying uh -huh. to make it better again or cool again in that sense. A bit sexier. Well, yeah. you know, it, it brings up the point that, um, you know, for, for those who are watching who are unfamiliar with, uh, with the Armoury, um, you know, how do you, how do you sort of describe the, the history of, uh, of the Armoury and, uh, and, you know, your initial inspirations and motivations for, uh, for you guys coming together and, and setting up that shop in, uh, in the Peta building and then, uh, you know, uh, proceeding to, to dominate the streets? as Donald Trump has, uh, has called it, coming to, wow. to dominate the world with the armory subsequently. Wow, okay. Uh, you know, um, it really started off with a bunch of people in Hong Kong, uh, a lot of guys in Hong Kong who really like suiting and like to chat about suiting. So uh -huh. it came from a lot of um, uh, basically wanting to know more, right? Sharing our purchases. We were shoppers. We were customers at tailors, shoemakers, and we wanted an outlet to sort of talk a bit more and, and I guess geek out and just, you know, a um, bunch of passionate guys and talk about tailoring. So uh, first a few meetings um, with Mark and a few of the other sort of menswear circle guys in Hong Kong, we were just really, you know, it was an opportunity for us to dress up, 
drink whiskey and chat and have a cigar, you know? Um, yeah, so sort of progressed from there, obviously. We sort of start talking to our tailors a bit too much, our shoemakers a bit too much, and, you know, realizing um, what, what that disconnect was in terms of uh, the, the, the people who really wanted to learn a bit more and that there, and that there was that demand of um, people wanting to buy more quality product rather than the commercial stuff that you have on the market nowadays and and that disconnect with again the tailors going out of business right you had yeah. probably Chan and Asta Chang and all these guys were slowly their customer bases were slowly aging and they were like you know wow we don't have any young customers we have like maybe one or two or three guys but no one really appreciates this stuff anymore mm. and at that time when we first started it was like a combination of um, customers who were aging very quickly uh, and that loss of that young new customers and also their talent pool you know all the tailors and, and basically people who wanted to work in the industry that was slowly disappearing as well um, but we sort of I guess identified that you know there should be um, something that connected everything and sort of pushed this agenda in essence okay. and, and you know from a value perspective from a shopping or shoppers perspective there should be more happening um, and yeah that's how it started um, I think there was the first few weeks where we were like oh, okay you know it's doing well but we never really got that you know flying start in the beginning everything was quite slow right mm -hmm. But it's really when social media sort of came about with Tumblr. I think that was one of our first social media platforms. You know, we mm -hmm. had a lot of time in the store. Uh, we started in the Petter building, so it's already quite hard to find. We'd be there, maybe handle maybe one or two customers a day at most. Really? Okay. Um, but, you know, these were quality customers at the same time. So, you know, yeah. come up because they were interested in it enough to find us anyway. So, you know, they, they would be essentially paying customers in that sense. But, you know, we had a lot of uh, interest and a lot of great conversations at the end of the day, sort of talking about menswear and, uh, you know, basically construction. And, and basically we got a platform to really talk a lot more about it. And it was really when we got to the social media aspect of it was that we started talking about it online and sort of... Mm. Uh, I guess uh, giving everyone a peek behind the curtains um, of of all the tailors and and you know shoemakers and all the artisans that we work with, which was yeah. I think for some reason with with all the brands at that time they it was closed off right because they were selling a brand and you know a lot of the quality that they wanted to sell wasn't up to par with the price point so there wasn't much to talk about right. So we were here just doing something new. It's like, you know, this is the quality you should get. And there's so mm. much love and passion and romance behind all the product. And there's just endless things to talk about. So, yeah, that's, I guess that's sort of when we started that whole content-driven space that we have now. That's, that's great. I've, I've, I've always been a, um, a great believer that it's – it's vital, uh, and, and I think particularly with the male consumer, because uh, not to sound sexist, but, you know, I, I think men are especially sort of obsessed with, with what's under the hood, you know, what's under the bonnet and, uh, and you know, looking into um, what makes stuff work um, and, and what goes into, into making something. And if you can, as you say, you know, uh, communicate the, the love, the materials, the heritage, the skills, um, you know, the hours of, of sort of careful, painstaking work that goes into making some particular, you know, whatever it is, um, whether, it's a, whether it's, a, it's a cake or whether it's a pair of shoes, um, all, of that, all of that stuff that goes into making something that is extraordinary and that, you know, maybe five or ten times more expensive than the kind of everyday version of that product, but, but there's a justification for it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it shouldn't be limited to menswear, right? I mean, for women, I, I feel that there should be the same or similar appreciation between 
or behind quality and value, right? There shouldn't be a disconnect there. Um, mm. I think the biggest difference though, and especially in what we do, is that there's that time factor, right? You know, waiting for a Leverano suit, waiting for an Orazio suit, the two or maybe in some instances with our shoemakers, the 18 months or, you know, two yeah. years that you have to wait for a pair of shoes, it doesn't quite go with fashion and how fast it goes. So if we were able to transfer that value and quality to, you know, a quicker time frame, I think it would similarly be applicable to women's wear. Speaking, speaking of, of your, um, you know, the tailors who, who come and uh, visit you, was that a hard sell initially when, as you say, um, you know, people particularly in Hong Kong have, have got this, you know, long-standing history of amazing, you know, well, very, very high quality um, and very accessibly priced bespoke tailoring or, you know, or, or perhaps made to measure tailoring. But, um, you know, was that initially a tricky thing for you to say, okay, we've got Liverano coming in um, and it's uh, significantly, you know, it's a different price point. Um, was that tricky initially? I know, you know, things have gone exceedingly well, but. Yes and no, yes and no. Um, you do have to understand we come from a background of not having sold clothes before, right? I, you know, I used to work in supply chain and consulting and then, you know, Mark was in real estate and yeah. everything else. So I'd never worked in a shop before. Uh, and from that sense, you know, we, we were basically just telling people, you know, this is, this is why you should pay for it. You know, it's very honest shopping perspective. We are shoppers and this is why you should buy it too. And okay. that sense, of, you know, a lot of us being in the shop and selling, we started with the most basic product because, you know, it was easy for us to sell in that sense. Uh, we, I mean, we, we trust in all our products, but it was just from a selling perspective, it was just easier to sell a cheaper product. Um, but, and not but, but, and, and, and I guess on top of that, we were a very new shop one, right? And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, selling a Liverano suit for us or selling a 50,000 Hong Kong dollar suit for us was obviously infinitely more hard than it is now where we have a lot of people saying, yeah, you should trust them. You know, there is, mm. there is a lot of uh, uh, credibility behind, you know, Liverano and there is that word of mouth already established. So, you know, back then it did take a lot of convincing before we got our first customer into yep. that Liverano suit. Um, but what did help, um, what did help was having actual product in our shop, you know, um, we were there, we wore Liverano, we wore Orazio. And so people could look at us and say, and see and say, oh mm. yeah, it looks good, right? Yep. This is what I should look for. This is what I should look like. And you know, it looks good at the end of the day, right? Um, and it feels good. So, you know, a lot of having a great example in front of them helped a lot. Um, whereas I guess, you know, in the more commercial shops, People wearing uniforms, so it doesn't translate mm -hmm. as much, right? Yeah. You, you go to Dior shop and they're wearing their black Dior uniforms, it, and it's not like the customer is going to be like, "Hey, I want to look like, you know, the, the stuff and wear buy the uniform." And I don't think they can actually buy the uniform even if they wanted to, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with us, then it was a slightly different thing where it's like, "Oh, yeah, you, you've worn it, you wear it." At least you can tell me from personal experience, you know, yeah. what it's like. And that helped a lot, obviously. Did you also find that, uh, that you know, those first few customers who, who did say, okay, I'm going to give this a whirl, I'll give it a try, that they really couldn't go back after they'd done that, that they, that they you know, uh, found that tailoring so, oh, so exquisite and so superior? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the big things is that, you know, we were one of, the more, I guess, one of the first champions of that soft tailoring outside of Italy, right? So, yeah. you know, having that first soft Neapolitan suit is already, you know, apples and oranges. And then on top of that, then we're sort of, I guess, a bit more educated and sort of knowledgeable in terms of what is suitable for our hot weather. So, you know, everything compounded, um, you get a suit that's soft, 
comfortable and sort of breathable to wear in a place like Hong Kong. And a lot of the customers back then was, you know, were from the, the region. So, you know, in hot and humid climates. And, you know, I don't think anyone at that time really had a good solution to wearing a suit in the weather like that. So I think, you know, we did make a huge tangible difference in that sense. Okay, amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, you you recognize those parallels between between Naples and and Hong Kong and the fact that you know the the guys over there are dealing with a similarly you know um, an environment a climate that is uh, that's super hot um, lots of the year but they manage to manage to look so uh, so sp stylish. I mean, you know, it's uh, parallels with with Singapore as well. And I see that the uh, the guys from Raffles Hotel here. Are, um, are watching our conversation. Uh, you know, have you ever thought of, uh, of opening up an armory here in Singapore? Uh, I think you might know I'm from Malaysia. Uh, actually, my sisters are based in Singapore. Sure. So, and even, you know, I have extended family in Singapore as well. Last Chinese New Year was my first Chinese New Year in Singapore. So, I mean, uh -huh. Chinese New Year is basically the Thanksgiving of of, of my family, right? Yeah. So we, we have to go back and see everyone, basically. Um, but I spent Chinese New Year in Singapore um, this year. And, uh, you know, being there was very nice. It is home. Um, and, uh, yeah. In terms of having an armory in Singapore, I think there are a few options already in terms yeah, of, of yeah. trying to buy a suit or or jackets. And, and I do see a lot of young sort of very very quality sort of uh, retailers um, or and small retailers so you do get that sort of intimacy and, and i guess that that one-on-one -on -one sort of dialogue that you should have with your tailor uh, and i think there are a few now i think um for the armory to be there right now might be overdoing it um, okay. no, no, no. We're, we're, we're well catered to here it was just uh yeah um and 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 look there's there's probably going to be lots of uh, lots of lots of empty retail space after we after we come out of this crisis anyway so uh so look there we are someone did ask the question a little bit earlier um someone was asking the question about about socks and i always find that sock shoe trouser nexus uh, an interesting uh an interesting sort of menswear conundrum how how do you generally approach that or what would be your key advice on um you know the standard thing is that you wear a pair of well some say you should wear socks that that match your shoe color um it's more conventional to wear socks that match your uh, your trouser color or you can wear something that's uh, that's very um in, in in great contrast what's what's your approach to that area uh you know, at the end of the day, a lot of it is personal preference. But I think, um, you know, with, with a lot of what we sell, it's all about being subtle, about being conservative uh, for a lot of it. So in terms of socks, uh, we tend to go with a tone-on-tone -tone approach. Not necessarily the same color, but in terms of tone-wise, you know, it's sort of like that light gray with the light blue or, or the light gray with the light trouser works quite well or you know, the dark tones with your your heavier sort of shoes in terms of colors work quite well as well. And you, at the end of the day, a lot of our concept comes from, we don't want to be just looking at your socks the whole time. You know, we don't want our socks to be screaming. We've got beautiful jacket. So that's that's where, you know, your, your eyes should lie. <laughs> Okay, uh, fair enough, but fair enough. I think from a texture-wise, you know, there, there's my personal preference is from a texture-wise. So um, a lot of plain socks, as in non-ribbed, you have your red socks with a lot more texture to it, and you have a lot of, you know, more patterned socks that provide a lot of more interest. Uh, but I find that a lot of the plain socks, once you go tone-on-tone, tone, you tend to lose a bit of it, that, that uh -huh. interest. So I tend to vary that. Um, I always look down, it's like, oh, if I've got like a plain colored, you know, uh, linen, linen trouser with a plain gray sock or something, it just becomes one big blob. Okay. So, 
Yeah, texture. Uh, texture speaks a lot. Yeah, people forget about texture. Now, now on this, you know, uh, answering menswear conundrums uh, topic. Obviously, I've, I've been noticing and really enjoying the um, the little videos that uh, that you uh, have, uh, you and Mark uh, have both been um, doing uh, in recent times. Is that quite a recent thing? Is that something that you've you've just sort of uh, taken to doing? Now, when uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing more and more of this uh, of this sort of you know, I've only just started doing these interviews because I'm I'm stuck here at home, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, helps stave off the loneliness. But uh, but yeah, <laughs> what 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 inspired you to uh, to start doing um, those and sharing your uh, your knowledge and wisdom in that way? Yeah. Um... You know, credits to Mark and Sam. They've really been pushing really hard you know, ever since. Well, a lot of it, I think, is due to Mark being stuck in Hong Kong. You know, he's never really been right. in one place for, for too much time. But, you know, him being in Hong Kong and sort of, uh, I guess, um, with with everything that's going on, obviously, uh, we needed a channel and, uh, you know, outlet to sort of uh, uh, push a lot more of, what we do and what we've learned um, mm. out into the open. Um, you know, we've done it in the past here and there, but never on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, we've, if you look at our YouTube channel to a certain extent, then you see, you know, things from four years ago or three years ago where we featured artists and we've dabbled here with, here and there with videos. Um, uh, but you know, after we started posting all of these online, and I definitely think there is a timing aspect to it as well. Um, but yeah, you know, after we started um, just doing very quick videos of um, things that we normally talk about in the shop, then we realized that, you know, um, bringing that shop experience online can be done in a certain way. So that's what we've been trying to do, is sort of provide that in-shop experience online. Mm -hmm. um, through this video, I mean, we've always been trying to do that, but it seems like this, this the the past few months have been uh, particularly effective for us in terms of format and uh, yeah, and, and just how we do it. Okay, no, it's great. It's um, I, I think it's it's really important to to give back and to to share that that knowledge. Um, and you know, you certainly you can communicate with exponentially more people via social media um, or via this this digital means than you can one on one on one on one so you know it really allows you to kind of amplify that voice and uh, and get that message out there so it's great yeah i mean, i think uh yeah i think we have gotten a lot of engagement out of this uh at the end of the day in the shop what we have always been trying to do is try to engage with the customers you know, and, you know, I always, I've been always saying about the fit and like just now we're like, you know, we always have to have the conversation and, and have the argument, you know, it's an argument, it's a dialogue with your tailors and you know, it's through that where the armory really has connected with our customers, right? It's not yeah. just a one-off purchase, you know, in, in that sense and e-commerce also is not similar to our in-shop experience because you don't get you know, a lot of our guys just telling you, hey, you're just wearing your trousers wrongly. And then it's like, well, what? You know, a lot of our customers basically came in with a, sort of almost like a disgust. It's like, why are you telling me what I shouldn't wear or what I should wear? I came in to tell you to do something for me, you know? Okay. Um, yeah, like, you know, that, that whole conversation, I think, is part and parcel of our business or should be anyway. Um, yeah, I remember the first few years where you had people come in and, you know, they saw an ad where it's like, oh, yeah, newest tailor in town. It's like, we're not really tailors. We work with a lot of tailors. But they mm. come in and be like, oh, yeah, I have a really favorite Dior suit that, you know, um, I saw online. Can you guys copy it? Or, you know, a lot of things like that. You know, I have an oh, old pair of shoes that I really like. It's really comfortable. Can you get your shoemaker to just copy this kind of thing? Right. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah a lot of misconceptions that we actually took time and knew enough about to sort of converse about, you know? So I think a lot of people left not 
not uh, just saying, oh, you can't do it. It's sort of like, oh, uh, I learned something new. So I think a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of learning from, from our perspective and our customers as well. So yeah, we built, we built a nice community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and as you say, you know, what you, you guys do, I guess, was, was a relatively um, new hybrid model. But I'm, I'm curious, kind of, you know, one of the last things I, I would like to ask you about is, um, is how does that, um, that personal one-on-one -on -one educational approach, you know, everything is, is sort of, you know, growing more and more online and more and more e-commerce focus these days and I know you guys are you know very active um, in that area as well as the you know um, bricks and mortar um, how apart from you know well I guess I guess you know it's, it's part of it these instructional sort of videos and social media uh, stuff that you're doing is part of it but yeah um, how do you do you bring the, the same sort of offering that same personal touch and that same educational touch that you offer in bricks and mortar into a, into a digital experience and, and offering that to, to guys who aren't just in New York and Hong Kong um, and uh, you know, trying to access what you do wherever they are in the world? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Uh, we, do, we do try our best to obviously connect through the videos um, that we've been doing, Instagram, social media. But there is definitely a limit there, right? Um, there is that lack of one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, if you look at our Instagram messaging, sort of direct message basket or whatever, that side is always full of questions. And we try to engage. So we, that's, I guess, our contact point. And then we sort yeah. of bring it to a different level in terms of messaging and sort of dialoguing with our customers. We do have a lot of customers um, who WhatsApp us and also email us, obviously. and but the WhatsApp, WeChat, and all those sort of forms of messaging have been very, very sort of effective for us to have a proper conversation. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it really is quite hard, but we we're trying to make do with technology, obviously. Um, yeah. And, and it has improved over time. Um, yeah. No, but it's, but it's a, well, technology also obviously has its... Um advantages because as you say you know you can you can build a community from around the world and i imagine um you know you'll probably get a lot of people coming into into your shops who say i've made a pilgrimage here and and coming to the armory was one of my main reasons for certainly for for visiting hong kong would that would that be true to say that you get some people coming in saying hello i live in kazakhstan and i've come to hong kong just to check you guys out or uh, Timbuktu, wherever they come from. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of people who pay a visit to the armory, which is amazing and very flattering. Um, you know, I remember, I remember greeting uh, uh, the, one of the directors and president of Hermes, and he was like, "What are you doing oh, here?" You know, it's like, okay. oh, yeah, I came out to check out the shop. It's like, oh, really? You've heard of us? Or like? You know, CEO of HSBC or, you know, some of these like big, big hitters and be asking them, you know, um, you know, where have you heard of us? And a lot of them actually, funnily enough, at that time anyway, um, they were following us on social media and okay. you know, on, on Tumblr or Instagram. So it's quite surprising to me at that time who were reading all these and consuming all this social media. Um, we were thankfully one of, I guess, the first movers in that respect, and we gained a lot of eyeballs in that sense. And um, somehow we managed to make it interesting, um, you know, through, I guess, a lot of honesty and just us being us. Um, but yeah, uh, it was quite interesting to see who came up to the shop and where they came from, too. Um, yeah, from all over the world, really. Um, yeah, uh, it, it does help that Hong Kong is such a, a such a great hub. Yeah, yeah. And, and everyone's just flying through at some point in time. We just made an extra stop. You know, the army was an extra stop for them. Well, I, I personally cannot wait to to get back to uh, to your beautiful city there. Um, final thing, very last thing that I'll ask you before I uh, 
I bid you farewell and go and make my, my first martini of this Friday evening is, um, you know, where are you, where are you looking forward to, uh, to getting to next when the, uh, when the planes are, uh, uh, when we're allowed to take off in the air again and uh, are liberated to fly off to our favorite locations, where, where are you just itching to get back to? Oof. There are too many places. There are too many places. You know, you know, we used to fly a lot. Sure. Basically, yeah. I flew at least once a month, right? Uh, at least yeah. once a month, and Mark even more. Um, but it, there's definitely that itch to travel again. Uh, I definitely miss Italy a lot, um, mm. especially climate-wise, and just the food there is so amazing, and just the friendly faces we've been we've been missing for so long. And, you know, Japan is obviously on high on that list as well for the same reasons, you know, the people and the food and, yeah, uh, yeah there's so many places. Um, I was supposed to go on a diving trip that got cancelled, obviously. Um, yeah. The, the plane gave me a credit, so no refund. So I have to <laughs> use it at some point. So You've got yeah. that in your back pocket for somewhere. No, but I, well, I think it was, it was just today, wasn't it, that... Um... The, the PC organization announced that uh, the, the initial June to September postponement, it's just being ruled out now. So, uh, so yeah, no PC in, no, in September. It was supposed to be postponed to. Um, is this news? Uh, to you? I, I knew it was postponed in September, but did you say it's canceled altogether? Yeah, September's not happening. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, it makes sense, though. It does, it does, but uh, but yeah, you know, the the great annual summer gathering of the menswear tribes is, uh, is sadly well, not well, happening this year. It'll be interesting to see how it affects the buys, right? When you can't actually see, I guess a lot of people will be will be buying sort of over photos, over Zoom and stuff like that, mm. and uh, there won't be, or there'll be less of that tactile and you know seeing that product in person. It's quite interesting to see how the buys will go, especially for the more commercial brands. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I think the same can be said, um, you know, fashion shows, it's just not the same thing, watching it on, on, uh, online or digitally. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, particularly uh, stuff like that, where, you know, and, and I, I think especially in the, in the type of menswear that, that we're interested in, so much of it is is touch and feel and uh, and, uh, and and aesthetics that you just you know do not see through yeah. a, through a camera. So uh, yeah, interesting yeah. times ahead, I guess, as they say. Yeah. yeah, it'll be it'll be quite interesting to see what colors work, what textures work when you're yeah. over a video call or or from a photo. So maybe maybe that'll be the new world we live in. Impact on colors and texture from a Zoom perspective. That that is yeah. I mean that's exactly the thing. You know um, that essential item of of women's clothing, the little black dress, just looks absolutely absolutely dead over uh, um, in photographs and and over over cameras like this. So uh, yeah, um, perhaps the yeah you know this uh, we're 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 looking at, at interesting new times and and digitally driven evolution evolution ahead so uh, interesting it'll be interesting to see yep Great. well it's been it's been excellent speaking with you my friend uh, thank you very much for for sparing some time and uh, yeah take care of yourself um, stay safe on this on the streets of hong kong you know you guys have been going through if it's not one thing, it's it's the next. So uh, yeah, um, take care. All right, thank you. Good speaking. All right, Alan. You. Great take to care. speak with you. Thanks again, my friend. Cheers. Thank you, bye. Thanks, everyone. See you later.